Okay, so uh, we are all live again, and uh, we, we are recording. So remember, as we talked about at the beginning, there's a chance to uh, do a re we're going to do a rebroadcast this, this evening, and then we're going to post things online. Um, it's really wonderful to have, a, uh, once again, a very broad and diverse group of people here together for the second session, where we're again, we're going to talk about personal experiences, but maybe even a broader perspective. There was already an international uh, component to the, to the first session. I think that may be even stronger here, but also teaching in different types of schools. Uh, that's going to come up here. So I think without any further ado, uh, let me turn this session over to our session chairs and thank both Kanchana uh, and Ed from AIT in Thailand and Edmundo from UFRJ in Rio uh, for being session chairs. We'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, let me try to, ma to manage this. Okay. So, Good. perfect. My screen on? Yep. Okay. Good. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's almost midnight for me. So, I have to be excused if I'm a bit sleepy. Uh, anyway, uh, I'll try my best. Uh, we want to uh, you know, this session is the, we are covering more than one, you know, for uh, the paper that in this session cover more than one course, uh, unlike the first session. So uh, we are now, uh, you know, uh, we, we have many field papers from uh, international communities and uh, there are many common issues that been addressed in all these uh, papers. So I would like to summarize the issues and then Edmundo will go through all the papers uh, briefly with you before we move to the panel. Uh, the first issue that been discussed in, all the, in most of these papers uh, about uh, uh, assessment. Um, you know, apart from, you know, worrying about how to run examination, uh, we found that to, to be to run online classes, you need to have more uh, frequent assessment on, you know, a continuous assessment uh, to keep the interest of the student and to be able to evaluate how you're going. So there's, this means that that's, uh, the instructor had to create relevant uh, assignments, tests, quizzes, and hand-on labs. And that means a lot more work for them when you come to online classes, and, you know, unlike uh, normal face-to-face uh, -face classes. So the uh, next uh, issue that been addressed in many uh, papers is to do with uh, the lack of uh, devices. You know, unlike Promethe in the last, uh, in the previous uh, session where he had all the gears uh, set up for his uh, synchronous teaching. Uh, most people in developing countries do not have that. They don't even have microphone. So <clears throat> this kind of uh, issue has to be uh, overcome by, you know, normally the university administrator would address this kind of uh, trying to, to fix the problem. But for the students, some, of the, uh, some students don't have computers at home and they may even end up with just attending the classes using mobile phone. So uh, the devices, uh, you know, become uh, problematic for uh, online classes. Another issue is that when they have to do the study from home, uh, some uh, poor student had to attend to their own uh, you know, they have to stay at home, which is not uh, a proper place for their study. They have to attend their domestic duties and uh, their accommodation may be very cramped. So uh, not uh, a suitable place for online uh, classes. Another issue with that was addressed by um, most papers that uh, the lockdown came without uh, preparation. So uh, st instructors were not trained how to use uh, video conference platform and you know, even LMS, they, were not, they didn't pay attention to the uh, learning management uh, system before uh, the lockdown. And 
uh, even after the lockdown, they didn't have time to do that. So uh, they end up using video conferencing uh, platform and uh, what they need is to have some kind of guideline or best practices, which is not available for this uh, time. The last issue that uh, everybody uh, talk about is the internet, uh, you know, internet connectivity, which is the main problem uh, in accessing online classes. I like to go to the problem. Uh, how to go to the next, ah, okay, um, yeah. So uh, we found that uh, in many developing countries, uh, that we still have problem of uh, low internet uh, penetration rates. So uh, people end up using uh, cellular uh, phone, the uh, 3G or 4G in order to connect to the internet and uh, the coverage of 3G is not uh, everywhere. It's, you know, in many countries, there's a lot, you know, a lot of uh, white spot, and uh, you find that uh, poor students, when they have, they return to the their home in the rural area, they ha don't have uh, access to the to the online classes because of uh, 3G uh, coverage, and the cost of 3G or 4G is just uh, too high to uh, in order to use the phone to attend the class because uh, uh, you cannot I mean uh, the charge of 3G is still very really high and even though during the uh, the lockdown many uh, telcos offer subsidy but it's still not uh, sufficient for uh, for uh, students to use the 3G access effectively for to attend the class. As you could see that in Pakistan, uh, the, the, uh, in the previous session, uh, there's a protest against uh, using, uh, against online uh, classes because they simply could not afford it. I mean, they could not, they either could not afford it or either they could not, they didn't have the, the internet at all. Or moreover, the quality of access, even though you can pay for the access, you, you have very poor quality and uh, your 3G is not good enough for interactive classrooms. So uh, you cannot do video streaming, you cannot do screen sharing. So uh, you, you know, this a lot of problem that the student have to solve in order to attend uh, online classes. So it means that for the first few classes, uh, people made that effort to attend, but after a few classes, you found a lot of dropout. So that was reported in many paper, in many of these papers. Another issue that we found is that the uh, university has to make decision on how, uh, what kind of platforms that they want to adopt for video conferencing. That's um, in the. The, we found that people wanted high quality video conferencing and they want to use the commercial uh, platform that have been, you know, that all of you have been using. But um, in the developing countries, uh, these are relatively new and uh, it's, uh, the free access is limited to 40, 45 minutes or something like that. And so uh, uh, in the end, they would have to, you know, they, they would have to pay. And for the open source one, uh, there are people who are using uh, big blue button, but um, uh, they would also complain that uh, the quality is not as good as the commercial one. So the, the uh, open source one was the, in, they could install the open source one in their own universities, but um, they complain that the uh, the network to the university can be a bottleneck. In, you know, they they could not uh, access the um, the server properly. But in many countries, like for example Thailand, uh, we would have preferred to have. Uh, 
uh, these services inside our country, but it happened that uh, all the platform uh, uh, overseas, uh, they, they are on the cloud in Singapore or in other countries. That uh, means uh, we have to pay for international bandwidth to go and get the, you know, to, you talk to someone inside your own country, but it, the traffic has to go to out of your country and come back again. And the international bandwidth in my country is very, very high. And so uh, we had to make uh, this kind of uh, decision you know, when, to, uh, when and where to place uh, the services. The other, the last point that I want to raise is an issue that I didn't see mentioned um, anywhere is the role of the research and education network during this pandemic. The whole thing has been very quiet, so I would like to raise this myself uh, to, the, to, the, to the group after the panel discussion. So I'd like to hand over to Edmundo to provide a brief uh, overview of each paper. Thank you. So thank you very much, Kashanda. Let's see if I can uh, share uh, here. Uh, I guess, uh, Jim, you need to give me the right to share. Hello? Uh, Kantana, can you uh, turn off your screen sharing? And then, okay. then Mundo yeah. can turn his on. Sorry. Okay, now you can try again. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you see it? Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, is there a way to get full screen or the slides or it's that okay, it's PDF? If you use PowerPoint instead of PDF, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyhow, <laughs> let me go. I think you can survive <laughs> with that. Uh, so uh, Kanshana uh, did a, a very nice overview of everything. And it's uh, it, very interesting that uh, mo a lot of our problems are very uh, similar. And I'm going to talk specifically, very briefly, five minutes, hopefully, about each uh, paper. So the first paper will be number 10 in the, uh, <clears throat> in the schedule. Uh, it will be uh, also will be presented here by Anand. In, and uh, it gives you a perspective of different universities uh, 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 in the US. So first of, uh, say, online education issue, it's a change permanent or not? So we can discuss a little bit about that. And what about the uh, institutions there? So the paper describes the difference in institutions are richer and the world has much less resources and the effect of uh, teach and learn online. So there is many issues that we can discuss about that and, and uh, Anand is going to present to us uh, in a few minutes. So um, next paper is the adoption of distance learning uh, in, uh, in uh, perspective of Senegal. Uh, the paper will also be presented by uh, Bamba uh, Gue, if I pronounce it correctly. And uh, it's interesting and it, it's a large, uh, they were able to monitor uh, the adoption of online learning in three, uh, three courses, three networking courses in a large university in Senegal. So they, take, they took a lot of measurements and the white paper discusses several issues concerning students inequalities. Uh, <clears throat> Kanchanda mentioned, uh, we have also that problem in Brazil, access to internal service, uh, uh, to internet service, etc. So the paper number 15 uh, also is gonna presented uh, by uh, Sukumai Mao uh, Kitsin and his experience in teaching network related course from the perspective of Thailand. So uh, they contrast the teaching and uh, before and after pandemic and the experience and lessons learned during the pandemic, like in terms of preparation that we heard also in the previous uh, panel, uh, teaching, exams, tools, etc. Paper number 17, uh, network education, but in the uh, Caribbean perspective uh, uh, from uh, Daniel uh, Foucault. 
uh, it describes the situation before the pandemic and also uh, the lessons learned and raises several issues like uh, when students watch pre-recorded video, uh, plagiarism, which is a plague between uh, many of us, and student engagement that we also talked about in previous uh, uh, session. Paper number 31, uh, it's uh, a teaching network in the network we built. Uh, so by uh, Kelvin Long from US and talks about many of the ch challenges in both uh, sides of uh, US Mexican border, experience with tools, streaming, uh, mentions that we all, you must have a plan B uh, uh, for uh, at least one op option for one uh, Wi-Fi access. I, in fact, I, <laughs> I had that problem before. Uh, several hints to produce good quality materials. So go to the paper, there are many issues there. And uh, things that are, I think it's very important also. Tolerance with student, uh, respect cultural difference issues, and talks about encourage collaboration, which I think it's very important as well. And I'm gonna discuss that a little bit more about that. So paper number 34, teaching computer network across it by Indonesia. It's a perspective of Indonesia and has an experience of two different uh, universes in Indonesia. Online video learning is very costly, as Kashanda mentioned, connectivity issues, lesson learned, uh, and in fact, they promote also the use of WhatsApp uh, for those who have much uh, uh, difficult access to the internet and, and talks about short uh, uh, real-time lectures, etc. Paper number 43, it's a remote learning electric education during COVID and uh, it's a Pakistan perspective. And the paper is very nice. It talks about many issues faced by the education, such like, again, limited internet, and mentions the importance of presence. Uh, what, that, that's very important to be this presence for a student. And in fact, we have some issues like that uh, here. Uh, quizzes and assignment that we discussed before, uh, training for faculty members, students learning from experience of other, and finally, and also leveraging open education resources. I think it's very important. And finally, uh, paper number 45 is co-authored by Jean and myself, and I'm going to present later. So in one second, it talks about uh, uh, experience for a distance learning class we had in the state of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil for over 15 years and what uh, uh, experience can we leverage from this course. So data of uh, thousands of sessions, accessibility issues, and discuss a little bit uh, the future. So I hope you got uh, five minutes, uh, in fact, six minutes idea of the whole session and please join us. And I guess we can give the uh, 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 a voice or the microphone to the first person to Anand, please. So I think I have to be also given screen oh, share. So you have yes. to stop. You have to right. stop sharing it, Bundo. Yes, stop sharing. Okay, thank you. Okay, I guess you can see my screen. So I'll keep it to even maybe less than five minutes so that we can have an interesting discussion. So basically, this paper is on the impact of COVID-19 on education. And there, it all, the paper also has some tips to improve online teaching, uh, such as you creating good YouTube content. I'm not going to talk about the second half of the paper. I'm mainly going to talk about COVID's impact on education uh, in institutes of different rankings. So uh, the ranking here that I've shown is for, from the perspective of the US, but it's valid for other countries too. The same hierarchy would exist. So the research one universities, which are the top research universities and they have high research expectations. And in general, and this is not uh, like absolutely true everywhere, they have lower teaching load. Uh, usually they teach a course a semester, faculty in those institutions. Then we come to the research too, which is like kind of the medium sized research universities. Um, there's like, research expectation, but not as high as a research one. And the teaching load is slightly higher, somewhere between 
one or two courses a semester. And then we have teaching universities where the main focus is on teaching and the teaching load could be three to four courses a semester. And faculty at teaching universities have less expectation on research. So this is the hierarchy in the US and I guess it's the same in all other countries too. Now with COVID um, impact on teaching and everything moving online, what I want to talk about is how this is going to impact uh, or disproportionately affect schools with higher teaching load. So just to give you a perspective, I, I have taught at Research One where I got my PhD. Currently I am at a Research Two university and I, in the, in, before I joined uh, my current institution, I was at a teaching school. So I have taught at all these different institutions so I have some idea about these different institutions. So this is the second slide. So here I have tried to to summarize how I think about this problem. So what we have here on the y-axis is teaching load and along the x-axis we have the resources. So research universities in general have the highest amount of resources in terms of teaching assistants, the quality of the teaching assistants, graders, the different kinds of tools that they have access to and in general they have less teaching load per faculty. So higher resources, less teaching load per faculty. And the, on the, in contrast at teaching universities, we have like the least number of resources. They may not have any TAs or graders and the teaching load is going to be the highest. And from our experience from the spring semester, we know that teaching online or transitioning your courses to an online setting requires a, a lot of effort. So universities that have higher teaching load are likely to feel the impact the most. Now, I don't have any concrete solution on how to address this problem. So I would like to have an open discussion. Maybe we, the only suggestion that I have is maybe you could, we could share material across institutions that have a similar student body. So I'll stop here and I'll let the next speaker take over. So I'll stop sharing my screen now. So the next speaker can start. It's okay. Yeah, yes. we can hear you also, Bamba. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I'm presenting a perspective in Senegal and the roadmap of my paper. In the first three, I will talk about the issue that we can face in African uh, countries, in less developed countries, and the lesson where we learn about three networking courses. If you can see, Senegal is in West Africa. And during the COVID pandemic, the studies at UCAT were significantly restricted. And we tried to, to figure out how to overcome this uh, situation. In this sense, we used two digital tools like Moodle platform for asynchronous learning and Big Blue Bulletin for live interactive meetings. When we start this distance learning, we have some issue with a student union because they were not willing to start distance learning since a lot of students set off again in their village. And what we can see here on the figure on the top, on the red, red area, it is the different region in Senegal where they should face with Y spot. And in Senegal, operators are spreading the network based on population density. If you look at the figure on the bottom, we can see the people of square kilometer and land areas, the density population. Dakar, which is the capital, is on the west coast, 
they have the highest density population. And we can see the geographic distribution of 4G network. And when a student come again to their village, several pitfalls should be undertaken. Low broadband connectivity, and in Africa, consumers in African countries are paying some of the highest rates in the world for internet access. And we have the same trend across different uh, African, West African countries. Also, we should face with family obligation. Since a student set off again to their village, they do for, for, for women, they should do with family obligation, cooking and so on. And for men, they should do, do homework, life farming, and so on. And it is difficult to do distance learning with family obligation where you are located in villages. So in Senegal, if you look at this paper, you can see the geographic distribution of 3G network. And we can see that the coverage is based on population density. In contrast to developed countries where most users have internet access directly to their home, in Senegal, many users are connected by using cellular mobile network. And we have just one network operator, Orange, that provides solely ADSL access. Both remaining operators are providing internet access through 3G or 4G. And the cellular network customer use almost exclusively prepaid plans which are very expensive compared to student revenue. And in order to figure out the adoption of distance learning, we monitoring during three months, three online courses. I was the instructor of two online courses, the wireless networks and distributed systems. And we figure out why students are not very, the attendance of students based on some feedbacks that we have through students. And we monitoring the activities of students by using the Moodle platform and the big blue button. Big blue button uh, needs a lot of bandwidth. So due to bandwidth constraints that we have in UCAT, the big blue button server is hosted by Amazon in order to overcome the bandwidth that we should face by the number of students that will be involved on the platform. And we monitor it also the distribution of access to contents. And the main lessons that we gathered from this pandemic is the unequal access according to where students participate online courses. For students that are living on big cities like Dakar, Jurbel, Kess, they do not face with coverage issue. But for other students that are living outside main cities, they are in white spot. So they do not access to contents asynchronously or synchronously. Also, without key prepaid plan dedicated for education, it will be difficult to have a fair access. Also, we think that it may exist psychological barriers for a student to prepare, to purchase prepaid plan. For us, it is not normal to buy some connection, some prepaid plan solely dedicated to education. Because I think that since a student are living at home, they do not need transport tickets to buy food and so on. And this money can be used to purchase prepared plane. Mm -hmm. But 
they do want, they do not want to use this money to buy to purchase prepaid plan since for us before pandemic they are in face to face approach and they do not need to pay something to to learn as conclusion in senegal or in less developed country available physical infrastructures as well as academic stuff are not correlated with infrastructure in order to have a sustainable high education it is mandatory to promote distance learning because we do not have enough places enough academic staff to do efficient learning and by using a flipped classroom approach we can take into account the number of students that we have in less developed country that's the end of my talk thank you very much thank you very interesting we share many similarities good morning everyone um i'm siko malkedesin from preset Sad university um i will be sharing experience in teaching network related courses in thailand with you guys um the paper was co-authored with um, colleagues from Mahidon University and also Chulalongkorn University. Let me give you a bit of the background. Um, Thai universities um, are in semester system. There are two group of them. Um, the second semester starting from Jan to May at, or um, December to March. So uh, we did a survey um, getting feedback from 13 faculty members from Nye University and um, the pandemic hit us in the, um, the third week of March. So before the pandemic, um, we conduct our courses face-to-face -face as usual. Um, the course, the, starting from basic like um, networks, um, computer networks class until IoT, um, network security courses using these tools. The Google Classroom is our common um, LMS where uh, except for Mahidon University, they have their own customized modal based LMS. And uh, one of the colleagues here, um, Chayapon, he developed it, an open source uh, project called eLab Sheets with this used in Preset Sat University that provides um, student feedback, instant feedback to when students submit their answer and also allow the instructor to um, create multiple versions of the questions from a single template. Um, using the Python based backend support. Uh, these pictures show you the, uh, the, the, the type of questions. Do you have the same diagram with different subnet number? And um, some, instructor, uh, some instructors created Facebook group or line group as an additional communication channels uh, between students because uh, these two are very popular social networks community in uh, application in Thailand. The class size range from 30 students for um, activity-based classes up to 200 students uh, for the lecture-based um, class. So for the December to March um, courses, the pandemic happened uh, and there could be, there's no time for uh, preparations at all. The instructor just picked one of the conferencing tools that they're most familiar with and then doing the live lectures because it's only one or two weeks until the semester ends. While the courses that uh, fall between, between January and May, they have more time to prepare. Some, uh, for, for example, Mahidon University provide teaching tools workshop to all their faculty members and um, realizing that the student will have the a lack of resources. So the SIM cards, because we in Thailand, we, remain, uh, we rely mostly on 4G, SIM cards are given to the student, either by faculty or the universities. And in Atula Longgarn University, a colleague uh, started uh, a Facebook group called Teaching during COVID-19 to share 
the experience and know-how on how to use the tools and the best practice thereof. And this Facebook group becomes uh, the very valuable resources to share among all educational um, community in Thailand. So during the pandemic, um, the instructor choose uh, either live online lectures or on, an on-demand ones. For the live ones, uh, it's due to the student attendance requirements of some university and um, some instructors cho uh, chose on-demand um, lectures because uh, based on the uh, effectiveness of student um, um, learning process. And there's, it's less stressful for the student and the instructor as well. Microsoft Teams, WebEx, Google Meet, and Zoom are the typical conference tool that people use here, um, mostly because the company has to deal with the uh, university upfront. We do experience network instability problems. Um, as you can see in the pictures here, the faculty members has a meeting and then um, it got some um, heavy um, volume of the traffic. And um, we also experienced the power outage. Power outage is um, a bit common and we have it once in a while in Thailand. So one of the faculty members in Bahidon University had to drive to up to campus to resume his live lectures, but luckily he lives nearby, so it can be resumed in like 15 minutes. Well, for activity-based classes, um, the instructor need, and teaching assistant needs to prepare more instruction, um, the video clips on how to set up the equipment because the student equipments come in diff, uh, various uh, form, various operating system, various platform. So they uh, require a lot more efforts um, well, if they were to do it in face to face, the student will help each other. For the exam, uh, definitely we have to have online open books, open everything, basically exam. Uh, there are approaches with limited time or flexible time period and um, to proctor open book exam with um, some limited time per section of the exam to prevent the, um, the unethical uh, collaboration between the students. However, the result comes out um, is not so good. The average um, score of the students is below 50%. That could be because uh, they are not familiar with the open-ended question style. Um, they're used to more of the uh, traditional what, why, how uh, question style. So the survey was done uh, from the student the students prefer face-to-face -face learning to online access, though they like the, uh, to be able to preview, uh, to review the recorded lecture at their own adjusted speed. And uh, since there seems to be a not fair uh, for the exam, for the students prefer project-based assignment uh, to taking examinations. Looking forward to the next semesters um, to come, from the student voices, uh, it seems that we have to pref uh, we have to provide lecture videos um, also together with the slides and the textbook up front. And um, from the instructor point of view, the student also needs to work on the physical real equipment. Um, so they decided to divide um, the student into smaller group and then take turns. Um, into coming on campus and work on the equipment while the others stay home and work on the virtual online labs. So the take home, the online exam kind of failed me uh, from the last semester. So we need a different kind of um, student performance assessment. So the short weekly quizzes with the project-based assignment of preferred and we hope to leverage um, the existing tools that can help us um, grade, uh, do the grading automatically and to help this prorate um, student cheating. So that's what we're looking for in the next semester. Thank you. Um, there are details of the, the process on each, uh, that each university has done for the exam. You can read more on the paper.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. What's the next speaker? I think you're the next speaker. Me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, time flies. <laughs> Can you see it? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, an experience that we been uh, we have in in the state of Rio de Janeiro in terms of uh, distance learning that's been going on for uh, last 15 years and uh, some lessons learned during this uh, shift to the COVID COVID times. So first of all, uh, uh, I'd like to add that we. Uh, talk about the computer science course uh, at the uh, distance learning initiative of the state of Rio de Janeiro. So since it's computer science, since the beginning, we use many, uh, we use a lot of measurements. We use a, a, a video uh, conference or a video tool uh, that we uh, developed at the, the university and it's embedded it's a lot of measures. I don't have time to go over uh, the measurements, uh, but just to give you an uh, idea, uh, in the left uh, hand side of the slides, we provide the measurement of where the students are watching, with parts of the video the students were watching without repetition, we also have with repetition, with the size, with respect to the size of the, uh, the video. So we have video from, uh, 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 let's say, half an hour to even two hours uh, video lectures. And as you can see in this uh, picture is that uh, students do not watch uh, the videos uh, uh, all the way from the beginning of the end. They jump a lot, they go in over. And this measurement, just to give an idea, is if, if we recorded uh, more than 700,000 uh, sessions, student sessions over a period of two years, and uh, we have more recent measures. But anyway, uh, uh, this is one of the things that we do. So, in uh, uh, in what I'd like to some of the lessons learned is that the students prefer to watch small sections in the video lecture. And uh, so should organize video lecture in terms of topic. They jump from topic to topic. So you should be aware of that. And um, important to collect measurements. I just saw one slide, but there are several uh, things that we can collect with simple measures to give feedback to the students. Like if the students are repeating one part of the video, why and then understand so that we try to understand and give uh, feedback to the faculty. And uh, one thing that we learn, not from the, uh, the map, but uh, from the students uh, in those 15 years, uh, is also the collaboration uh, among the students is a must to improve success rate. In fact, this is not only in the computer science or related to computer science, but it's related to other disciplines as well in other uh, fields like physics and things that the, 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 this consortium of public universities also offer. So the collaboration, I mean, studying together and discussion, lists of discussion, things like that. I think it's very helpful for this time. Uh, and uh, perhaps also we experiment also, we give in different explanations of a topic uh, from a given uh, 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 course, which it, I think would be very useful that we can, we could discuss like sharing the resource, we share different explanation from different faculty and they are all offered by in an organized way to the uh, students. Uh, 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 so we uh, say this, we, the course started in 2005 and it's still going on and includes more than 500 video lectures. And uh, so that's the uh, idea. So during the pandemic, uh, we, I'm sorry, I, during the pandemic, we had to understand the student faculty. So we stopped for a uh, 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 few weeks 
and uh, to try to understand the difficulties and access to the network. And then we can ask, but uh, are the students would have access uh, uh, already because they are distance learning, but uh, we provided to the student like, uh, like say small buildings all spread over the interior of the state that has poor resource so they could go there and, uh, and have access to the material. Once the pandemic came, that's, a, that's completely lost. And so we have the similar problems that we have in our universities. Uh, so we provide access uh, also in the, the, our university, uh, there's a lot of students have no access to anything. Most of the students have just a seller, but no data plan is expensive. So the university is providing like 13,000 uh, uh, ships for the students with poor access and other material to help them out. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, it's looking ahead, uh, uh, we, I think it's, uh, we have to measure learning outcomes. So, again, with simple measurements, with the tools that we have, we can learn a lot. And we try, would like to try to correlate interactions with the learning material, quality of online material, etc., and with the success in class. Uh, we tried to do a, did a little bit of that, but still is in infancy. So we think we, we can improve a lot if we cooperate. It's important to share also education resources and, and teaching material in an organized manner. So we as a community, I think we have the obligation to do that, especially uh, to learn the needs for the poor students. So how to do online assessment and exams. This is a big issue and I can talk a little bit more uh, about that, but I uh, doing the discussion. So I guess we learned that we all have the same issue. And since we are a global community, we have to find ways to automate translation and caption for education material. And finally, uh, design some uh, resource that can scale and uh, uh, go to the needs of the students who have very difficult access uh, at home for internet access and those have better access. So in a whole, I'd like to summarize that sharing resource and sharing experience in a global way, if we act together, would be much better. I think we can do a, a good job. Thank you very much. Let's stop sharing here. Thank you. Uh, can, can I read uh, the question from Slack for, for the panelists? Uh, I think Jim asked about, we <laughs> somehow it's gone. Uh, well, since I'm here, Kanchana, I can yeah, ask yeah. questions. You can ask, okay. yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. It's because, uh, yeah. Something that we saw again and again in all the presentations here and, and in some of the ones in the first session was the issue of equity in access and how, you know, what, what you know, the heterogeneity in student access. And my question was, when we have students on campus, all students get access to libraries, to a you know, an email account to Wi-Fi. So when you're on campus, there's some kind of presumed equity, um, but when you're off campus, it's not. And so my question was, to what extent do your universities think it's their job to sort of push that equity out to, you know, students when they're off campus? So Edmundo mentioned SIM cards uh, for students who needed access. And, and Sukumal, I remember from your, I think it was your white paper, that at least one of the universities was providing SIM cards for access and in Bombay, I don't remember that happening um, uh, at, at your university. So, you know, just generally, do, do your universities think about this issue of equity and access? Okay, uh, according to, to Senegal, the High Ministry of Education plans to put into free access education, uh, education platform. So, but students that are living in white spot will not be enrolled. 
so those that are in connected area can use freely the education platform. I think that in the near future, we can plan to put resources in USB keys or in DVD and so on to provide offline access. I have seen also on the Slack that someone are talking about satellites of Amazon for white spot. Uh, we, we, we need to figure out how much we should pay to access through the satellite. If in case of legislation and so on, the, net, the network operator can put some incentive to, to make some issue to use the satellite in African countries, perhaps. Just wanted to add to that point and like, why is it necessary that we have to use the internet? Because if you can use the TV in developing countries, but that is available even in rural areas and use that as a mechanism to, to send videos uh, and content. I know it's not going to be interactive, but I think that can be better than asking people to spend a lot of money to, to buy content. So this is something I had. Uh, I posted it on Slack. There were a few comments, but I just don't know why that's not being widely adopted. Can I answer a little bit of that? Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, one thing I think makes a difference, and I'd like to make a point, is that the students get lost with that. They have a sense of community once they are in university. And when we broke here, this disappears somehow. So one thing that we try to do in the very beginning, even if we are uh, uh, starting this semester was different than the US and other uh, North uh, countries. So we try don't leave the students alone. So try to make uh, them participate in the community. So in, in my case, a particular, I tried to get a few students that were more engaged and to help other students. And that I was pretty much happy that it helped a lot. So it's amazing that they could get organized and have this sense of, uh, of let's say, present, be part of something. Once you have the television, you lose that sense. And I guess, I guess, was one of the papers uh, in, in the session. It talks about that presence with other students, be part of the community. And I think that's one thing that I would like to raise as an issue. I found it very important uh, to have that create that community. So Edmundo, if I could react to what you just said, you know, there's a saying in English, something like perfection is the enemy of the good or something like that. And, and you know, so, so I forgot which white paper that was, but I read that too about how important presence is. And so we'd all like that, but it may not just be possible. And so there've been a couple of comments on the Slack channel to think about sort of multimodal distribution of material which won't make for sort of synchronous presence, but um, by DVD or, you know, so for instance, if you live in a white spot, a SIM card's not gonna help you, right? Mm -hmm. um, but maybe a DVD will. So think, thinking in terms of sort of more multimodal distribution. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, yeah. And okay. Uh, I read a question from, from Slack. Uh, would the panelists, share how the engagement or interaction experiences outside of the class hours uh, with the remote, I think, model. So the way I, okay. yes, if I want to answer, so the way I did it is I actually never had like in-person Zoom lecturing. I just found that remarkably inconvenient for computer science. So I actually had pre-recorded videos made students watch it. Um, and then in Zoom, we had like these kind of interactions um, on like problem solving. I didn't do a great job uh, the first time, uh, but I think more problem solving and breakout sessions would help rather than this kind of dry lecturing. And I think like Slack and some other software, that's Piazza, like incorporating that, which is free, um, or even like a Facebook group, 
where students can have like peer discussions, like depending on which platform is possible. And I think that would really help. But students, um, and another thing I found out was because of it's, it's uh, because of the issues that students are facing, I had to actually personally reach out to a couple of students, like using the LMS, you can monitor which students are kind of falling off. And uh, just to share a story, I reached out to two students. One student's family had been impacted by the disease and she was just like, lost because she was here and her family was somewhere else and I had to help her uh, navigate that. Another student just having these kind of internet issues. And so I think if it's a smaller class, it's kind of figuring out if somebody is tailing off would actually be a better idea to reach out because sometimes students, even if I would tell them a hundred times that you can reach out, I'm always available, will not actually reach out to you. So that's like outside the class interaction would be just to reach out to them if possible from time to time. Okay. Yes. Uh, I think uh, I, the question, I think, how about uh, Sukuman? Well, outside class, because the instructors um, created Facebook group, a line group, the students can interact with each other all the time. So like, sometimes we get questions at the night time, uh, mm -hmm. all the times actually, okay, outside so the classroom. It's like uh, in Indonesia, they use WhatsApp. <laughs> in Thailand, we used LINE as the uh, com very common uh, social media, uh, you know, to, to, to talk and set up a group discussion. We don't, we don't use Slack. It's my first time to use Slack here. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, uh, um, also in, in Senegal, according to Moodle platform, we have some forum on the on the on the website so a student can interact with the instructor or themselves it is possible to interact also mm -hmm. asynchronously we have monitoring the behavior of a student during all the daily lives oh that's good yes uh, because uh, during the lockdown is uh, people feel quite lonely actually not meeting uh, friends and colleagues. So it's really good to have this kind of um, social discussion with, you know, Line or Moodle. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Jim, I think since we have a bit of time, may I like to try to answer your equity issue. I've been working on internet con connectivity for so long. Uh, I think it's very hard to uh, to get a perfect, uh, you know, connect uh, perfect answer where everyone would be able to access to the internet and get, uh, you know, uh, involved into the uh, in active participation to the online classes, but. I think one way to try to figure out how to how to um, lessen the uh, problem is to try to set up a kind of learning small learning center where people can share facility. I think uh, in the community, so you can you can uh, you don't have to study at home. You can kind of use the same space and. Uh, share the space to access the classrooms because um, it's very hard to to connect to each house. But if you have a learning center which is connected to the internet, it's not too difficult. And people can share that facility in the re uh, rural area. I myself come from a very remote uh, uh, province, so I know we are, we are ready to to do, you know, to go for, uh, to go to a place where we can get connectivity. Mm -hmm. You uh, don't have to connect us to our home. I can, I'm willing to go to a place that I can, you know, study. I can uh, have my peace of mind and concentrate on my course. That's so, wonderful. Very nice that we, you mentioned that because in the state of Rio, that's exactly what we tried to do, but we had that previous, the pandemic. 
uh, in the interior, yeah. have those small centers that for local communities that uh, students could go, uh, we easy to access mm -hmm. and have much better resource. That has been working pretty much, but during the pandemic, that is gone. <laughs> but, I see. But, uh, no, but during the nice. pandemic, can you go out from your house and just go to, you know, to this uh, small place to attend Not, class? Are you allowed? Not, not yet. Uh, it will be uh, allowed when it, because we still have the problem uh, uh -huh. the growing. Uh -huh. not, but this works in, very. In Thailand, it's not nice. that. Big. We can. <laughs> we can Great. still go to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's one possibility. I mean, having a small center for mm -hmm. you know for mm -hmm. education. Another uh, thing that I would like to propose is to make use of the research education network. Uh, to host uh, education cloud and uh, you can put all this uh, you know like uh, platform on the research and education host the network that and the research and education network had um, been established in you know all regions and we are well connected with high speed network but uh, during the pandemic, we hardly had anything to do with research and education network. I think it's time to really see how to make use of that and to host the cloud inside the country for education. And we may have built an, our EDU platform and put everything on our e network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Can I add one quick point about equity? Before? Yeah. So, I, so recently, due to some personal reasons, I've had the opportunity to talk about disability and like how it affects people. I, at this time, I think if we talk to people who have had physical disability in the past, they would say that they would actually like this a lot. And somehow, as is usually the case, because they are a minority, we are we have not spoken to them. They, they really like the fact that everything is online because they don't have to take the trouble of actually making this physical. So if as a society, we actually talk to them and take ideas of how they learned usually and how this is helping them. And I think it's like, if we change and understand how they have been learning, I think that would actually help us learn as well. Like, and instead of, we have this issue of like all congregating in a particular place to learn, whereas they have been having this issue and they've learned how to learn by themselves and by other means. I think we can actually learn from them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Anand, I'd, I'd point out that the National Science Foundation funds uh, a network of educators working on exactly that problem. And I know uh, Richard Ladner at the University of Washington, for example, has been very prominent uh, in that. I'll, I'll look up a URL and post it. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim, uh, how much time we, we, we have? Uh, 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you and Kinshana can wrap up. <laughs> uh, maybe I, I say something and then I, I leave to uh, I, I Kinshana to, to, to finalize just 15 uh, seconds. I'd like to uh, uh, say that if we act as a community and share resources and that in an organized way, not because I'm a friend of this and that, but in an organized way and share resources, share experience and in very organized. And I, as you, uh, uh, another said, also listen to other people and the difficulties and try to understand, we can all be, uh, be uh, uh, prosperate uh, in, in a sense as a community. I think we have a lot to learn with each other. So that's my final. So. <laughs> okay, done. so are we done? Yeah, um, I, I, I think we're all you set. Want to, you want me to summarize something? If you have <laughs> just last yeah. remarks, um, and then we're going to be taking about a 10 minute break before the next session starts. But, okay. Uh, We'll leave so, you last words, Kanchana. Okay. Uh, well, um, Edmundo mentioned about shared resources. 
but um, I think in in order well I'll come back to the e equity uh, issue, I think we need to resolve the inter internet. I mean, the con I would like to propose that we seriously look into uh, using the internet uh, uh, research education network to solve the internet the equity for education. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, otherwise, uh, everyone is trying to figure out what to do with commercial network by themselves. And uh, we don't have a uniform uh, platform that can serve uh, everyone. Okay, thank you. great. Um, so Matt and I want to thank all of you uh, for both organizing their session co-organizers and the speakers and everybody who contributed uh, white papers in this really, really important area. So, and we'll continue on the discussion on Slack. And if somebody wants to propose a birds of a feather session, narrowing down on any of the several topics that came up, there's opportunity for uh, even more free flowing discussion tomorrow uh, in the second session tomorrow. So we're gonna take a break for about uh, 10 minutes um, and come back at uh, 45 minutes past the hour. So we'll see everybody back shortly. Um, for those of you who are speakers or uh, session chairs in the next session, we're gonna uh, change your status from attendee to panelist and you like the panelists here will have uh, audio, video mm -hmm. and screen sharing access. So we'll see everybody shortly. Okay, Bye. thank you. Sure, Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.